Welcome to the Core Concepts Lecture Series. This is sponsored by One Community Center, this is where we are, and the Institute of Applied Metaphysics. And we ask spiritual and religious leaders to come and tell us what they believe, why they believe it, and what they're doing about it. And it would certainly be uh, remiss of us not to have uh, one of Memphis's best-known uh, Catholic priests to come talk to us. Um, Father David Knight. Now, when I grow up, I want to be like Father Knight. <laughs> because here's a man that, I won't tell you how old he is, but most people his age are looking for a corner to sit in by the, by the, 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 the stove or uh, a rocking chair. And he is every day conducting mass for the clustered nuns of St. Clair. He's writing books, something in the neighborhood of 35 now. He's uh, making trips all over the world for retreats and conducting retreats at the monastery that he, I guess you administrate the place, you run the place, yeah. don't you? So uh, uh, that, that's my objective, to be like Father Knight. And we welcome you to the Core Concepts Lectures right, series. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, should I jump in? Jump right oh. in. Lord. You are all truth and all goodness. We ask you to bring us into your truth so that we might experience and live your goodness. We ask this of you, for our Creator and Lord. Amen. Uh, Jim asked me to talk about three things which I really like. What do you believe? Why do you believe it? And what are you doing about it? I love that. In fact, um, so he gave me 30, 30 40 minutes. Um, now, it's an impossible task, you know. I was asked once by the Memphis Theological Seminary, where I used to teach uh, spirituality, they said, can you teach a course on Catholic theology? I said, it's impossible. When you study Catholic theology, there's a number of courses. We have a course on the Trinity, on the Redemption, on the Incarnation, on the Sacraments, on the Church. You can't possibly teach one course on Catholic theology. So I've got to teach a course on Catholic theology in 30 minutes. <laughs> All things are possible to those who try. So what I did, I'm boiling down, I can do this. I can boil down Catholic theology into what you live. In other words, I can't give you all the theory, but I can give you how you live it. Because after all these years that I've been working on this, I think I've got it pretty simplified. So here's the first one. I'm going to put this in the first person. I believe about me because I was asked to put it that way. But actually, I'm talking about what I think everybody <coughs> does or should experience, you know, if they are responding to the call of God. As Christian or anything else, but we won't get into that. But I'm going to give it from the Christian point of view, and the Catholic point of view, and I'm going to talk about the, you know, if you're starting at baptism, if there's many ways you can. So here we go. First thing I believe is, I believe that through baptism, I received a new identity. And to put it in the most shocking way possible, I became Christ. The problem is, they taught us our religion and they dumbed down the mystery. They made it something that's easy to accept, but it's easy to accept because they don't tell you what's really going on. What do I mean when I say I became Christ? Well, first I became a member of a people, like the Jewish people. They were covenanted to keep the law of God. And that's what the covenant or the bond was based on. In the new covenant of the new people of God that I entered into, the covenant is not a covenant to keep the law. It's a covenant of blood relationship. You enter into this people by dying and rising again, obviously in a mystical way. But what I believe that what happened to me at baptism was that, if I say in the eyes of God, I mean in, term, in reality, I was incorporated into the body of Jesus Christ, hanging on the cross 2,000 years ago, <clears throat> with all of my sins, all I had committed or would commit. And when Jesus died, I died in him, and I went down into the grave with him, and all of my sins were annihilated. Now, this is really important, because <clears throat> if your sins are just forgiven, it doesn't change you. You forgive somebody, good for you, you're a loving person, you forgave this guy person you forgave is just as guilty as he ever was, and your forgiveness does not change him okay, or her. But when we died in Christ, 
The important thing is not that he died for us, it's that we died in him. In his death, we were incorporated because we were in that body on the cross. So we went down into the grave. God the Father comes along and says, you want to go back up to earth and start over? He said, well, can I do that? He says, well, if you go back up the way you came down, you came down as the body of Christ. If you want to go back up as the body of Christ and let my son Jesus continue to live his life and fulfill his mission in your body as in, as in his own, go into partnership with you to live, the two of you living a life in this body, then yeah, you can go back up. But you've got nothing to live for now except for with Jesus Christ. Live with you, live in you, live through you, act with you, act in you, act through you to continue his mission on earth. And that's the sense in which I say my identity has been changed and I have become Christ. That obviously means that I'm committed now to live not as a good human being, but to live a divine life. To live the life of Jesus Christ. To live on the divine level of God. It's a whole different standard of morality. Instead of the Ten Commandments, which are always valid, which, is, which tell us a good human way to live, we are committed to live by the new law of Christ, which we find in the Sermon on the Mount. And if you read that, those chapters, 5 to 7 in Matthew, there are, there's very little you could call a rule. It's very little that Jesus says that you could actually just do. There are more general principles, like love one another as I have loved you. I've said it later, but that's the rule. How do you just go out and do that? You can't just do that. That's something you aim at. Um, you know, all the stuff about turning the other cheek and going the extra mile and all that. Those are examples of a general principle, which is you should not value anything on this earth more than human relationships. So if somebody slaps you in the face, don't turn away. Stick out your neck for more. Stick out your hand again. They reject you. Someone forces you to go, well, takes up your time, forces you to go an hour out of your way, do more stuff. Give them two hours of your time. Someone takes away your coat, give them your shirt to say, look, my property is not important to me. What's important to me is relationship with you. You see how these are ideals. They're not just rules you can live. And they're the ideals for living on the level of God, which is impossible unless you have the divine life of God. So what I believe is that by baptism, I received a share in the divine life of God by becoming a member of the body of Christ, who is God. I received the Holy Spirit. I became a real son of the Father, not just an adopted son, not just a met metaphorical son, but that I have the Father's life in me. And therefore, I'm obliged to live as a divine child of God. Now that's the first thing I believe. My identity and the commitment that follows from that to live out that identity and to live as Christ. St. Paul said it, I live now not I, but Christ lives in me. The second thing that I believe is that I have been enlightened by God. And I call this a mystical experience. In fact, all five of these things I say are mystical experiences if we are aware of. Jim was telling us before we started, you know, how he teaches people to be aware. Well, you can be all sorts of things, but if you're not aware of it, what good is it doing? But when you become aware, that's when you have experience. So this awareness of divine enlightenment, what is that? First of all, um, it's a commitment. If I'm going to live as Christ, as his partner, not as a robot, not as a slave, not as somebody Jesus just says, do this and do that. As his partner, then he and I have to think alike. Partners agree on principles and values and goals. They do things together. They co-operate. And that's what we have with Christ. The Greek word is koinonia, but it's, it's partnership. If I'm going to act as his partner, I've got to know how he thinks. And I've got to know his heart, what he really desires. I've got to accept his values. Now for that, I've got to become a student. I have to become a student of the mind and heart of Christ. It's not enough to be transformed into Christ. You've got to be a, a lifelong student to learn his mind and heart. And that's called being a disciple. A disciple is not a follower of Jesus. The word disciple does not mean follower. It means student. So the commitment is to be a student. And I say, 
I like to say things that shake people up sometimes. And I'm talking to Catholics, I say, listen, you have as much obligation to read the Bible, if you can read, as you do to go to Mass on Sunday. Catholics are brought up saying, I've got to go to church on Sunday. But they're not brought up reading the Bible. I say, look, do you have to have a law to tell you that if God writes a book to teach you how to live, you ought to read it? Uh. So this obligation to study, and not to read it for laws now, but to read the Bible to learn the mind and heart of Christ. I say that that is a commitment inherent in the acceptance of this new identity. Now, if you do that, if you read the Bible and follow the three R's of discipleship, read, reflect, and respond. If you do that, then you are going to grow into the experience of divine enlightenment. It's not one of these sudden experiences, oh my gosh, your God just spoke to me. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the kind of experience you have when you're drinking coffee with somebody in your kitchen before the sun comes up and you're talking and it's dark. And after a while you look and say, oh, we can see now. When did you become able to see? You don't know. It just sort of happened. You know, the sun began to rise. Well, if you begin reflecting on the Word of God, there comes a moment where you say, you know, this stuff means more to me now. I understand this better. I like it. I appreciate things more. Well, how did that happen? You just intellectually more informed than you were before? No way. You have been divinely enlightened by God. And if that sounds like an exaggeration, uh, how would you feel saying, I am the light of the world? <laughs> Come on now. Hey, Jesus is the one who said that you are the light of the world. He's the light of the world, yes, but he said to his disciples, you are the light of the world. So I believe I'm the light of the world. Not by myself. But, you know, I'm one of the lights of, and the, Christ, the light of Christ is shining in me. And I think that is why it, you have to say you have the mystical experience of divine enlightenment. Okay, the third thing I believe. I believe that I am empowered by the Holy Spirit to bear witness to Christ as a prophet. When I was baptized, they anointed me with chrism in the top of the head. Chrism is the word from which Christ comes. Chrism, Christ, Christ means anointed in Greek, and the, the Jewish word for anointed is Messiah. So I was anointed to, to fulfill, to continue, the triple mission of Jesus as prophet, priest, and king. In the ritual it was as Christ was anointed, priest, prophet, and king, so live always as a member of his body. Now the first one is to be a prophet. What's a prophet? Someone who professes well. Nobody believes people who profess anything in words. People only believe our actions. So if I'm going to be a witness to Jesus Christ, I have to live in a way that simply cannot be explained unless I have the divine life of Christ in me. If I'm living in a way that can be explained by human motivation, human what, willpower, or whatever, I'm not a witness to Christ. I might live a very good life. Be very, very uptight. Not uptight. Upright. Sometimes the upright are uptight, but that's the one. Thing that I, <laughs> I, I could have a very upright life and be a really nice person, but that's not a witness to Christ. I'm a witness to Christ from the moment that my lifestyle begins to raise eyebrows. And people say, "How can you live like that? Why don't you do what we do? Why do you do that? How can you be serene or whatever it is when everybody else is not? How, how do you explain this?" And if the only explanation is Jesus Christ is risen from the dead and is living in me and empowering me by his spirit to do these things, then I'm a witness to Christ. So the third thing that I believe is that I'm empowered by the Holy Spirit. There's a scripture text for all of this. I don't, I don't want to waste time giving them, but the gift of the Spirit is right through Acts of the Apostles. Just read it. Um, I believe I'm empowered by this gift of the Holy Spirit and committed to a lifestyle that doesn't make sense without the faith. Now the easy, that sounds very threatening, and people say, well, I don't, my lifestyle doesn't raise eyebrows, that's kind of weird. The real way, to, easy way to put it is, I think I'm committed to at least ask this question before everything I do. Never ask again whether something's right or wrong. Ask, does this bear witness to the values of Christ? I say don't commit yourself to bear the witness because 
Don't commit yourself to something you know you can't keep. But if you keep asking the question, little by little, your lifestyle will begin to change, and you will begin more and more to live in a way that bears witness to his values. And that's the experience of empowerment by the Holy Spirit. But only if you go beyond just the ordinary, nice human morality. The fourth thing I believe is that God has promised me a posterity. Now, I'm a celibate, so uh, it ain't going to be a physical posterity. Okay? And if it were, I wouldn't tell you about it. <laughs> but he promised me a posterity as he promised Abraham. Now, Abraham was physical. He would have children and grandchildren. Da, 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 da. But he said to his apostles, you didn't choose me. I chose you. And I have appointed you to bear fruit. A fruit that will endure. Christ has promised me that my life will have an effect on other people that will endure forever. What is that effect? The best way to get it is to go to St. Paul, who said to the people he converted and worked with, he said, I am in labor again until Christ is formed in you. Christ, uh, Paul saw his ministry as bringing Christ to life in people, bringing Christ to life, and then fostering that life until Christ grew to full stature in each one of us. So the mission, uh, to the ministry that I believe that I was consecrated to in baptism as now not just prophet, but now as priest. We're all priests by baptism, not just the holy orders guys. That ministry is to give divine life to people and enhance it in the people who already have it. How do you do that? I can't give divine life. The only way I can do that is to surrender. <laughs> see, you see where this is this isn't just willpower and I'm gonna do stuff. Surrender to letting Jesus Christ, who lives in me express himself through my physical words and action. What's that mean in reality? It means that every single person I deal with, every single person, I should be conscious of dealing with this person in a way that gives expression to my faith. You can't lay your faith on people. I don't believe in buttonholing people and saying, are you saved? Let me tell you about Jesus. I mean that if I treat you with the kind of respect that I would treat my brother or my sister, I'm expressing my real faith because I believe that if we have God as our Father, we are brothers and sisters to each other, and I've got to treat you as I would a brother or sister. I don't have to say you are one because you might think I'm crazy, but if I express my faith and live in a way that shows the hope that I've got, that my hopes are in the promises of Christ, that I'm living not for what I can get out of this world, but I'm living for that which Christ has promised and will give, then the living of that is the expression of that hope. And finally, and more, important, more important than anything else, if I let Christ express his love for people through me, if I try to love people the way Christ loves, in other words, everybody. Christ loves everybody. The sinners. Christ loves the terrorist uh, suicide bombers. Christ loves everybody. And I've got to love everybody. So how do you do that? Well, it's certainly not emotional. You cannot choose to have the emotion of affection for anybody at all. You might have it, you might not. But you can treat everybody in a way that shows two things. So this is the old definition of love. It shows that you want this person to be, and you want this person to be everything they can be. Love is defined as to want somebody to essay as bene essay in Latin. To be and to be everything they can be. Isn't it true that if there's somebody you don't like, that you don't even want to look at them, you prefer they weren't around? In fact, you kind of prefer they weren't on the planet? Yes. <laughs> you may not go that far, so far as to say it. But if you love, you want this person to be and be everything they can be. And I say that that commits me to dealing with every person in a way that expresses my faith, my hope, and my love, so that Christ, through me, can communicate his divine life through my physical words and actions. The fifth thing I believe. I believe that Christ has promised to renew the face of the earth. We have a prayer that says, Holy, that send forth your spirit and our hearts will be regenerated and you will renew the face of the earth. But when I was consecrated at baptism to share in the kingship of Christ, <clears throat> the word for this really is stewardship, I was consecrated to fulfill Christ's mission as prophet, priest, and king by letting Christ 
bear witness through me in my lifestyle, give life through me in my ministry to other people, and to change the face of the earth, to establish the reign of God on earth. Reign of what? Reign of peace. Reign of justice. To make everything on earth according to the way God wants it to be, which would turn this world into a paradise. So it is a commitment to work, we say today, to work for social justice. You can use any word you want. You can work for ecology, you can work for social justice, you can work for political reform, for reform of the church. What well, doesn't make any difference. <clears throat> what you're committed to is to take responsibility for change. And everybody knows it's impossible. You really think you can change the government? You think you can change the school system? You think you can change the church? Do <laughs> you think you can change anything, really? And the answer is an overwhelming sense of helplessness. And Christ says, you have to have confidence. I have overcome the world. And I am going to win. I'm going to triumph. I won't tell you when, but the, the, I'll tell you what the, the scoreboard at the end is going to say, you know, we're winning. I don't know if it's going to say 100 to nothing, but whatever it says, it's going to be Christ's triumph. So if I really believe this, and I, and I believe that I am called to work for the victory of Christ, and I have to believe in it, and I have to hope for it. Hope is the center here. You have to keep your hope that when things seem hopeless and you feel helpless, that you have to keep working to establish the reign of God on earth by whatever way you can. The key word is to take responsibility. You can't necessarily achieve the results. But if you take responsibility for it, you'll notice, it's a key word here, you'll notice what needs to be changed, and if you can change it, you'll try. So the fifth thing that I believe in is that I'm committed to have a sense of responsibility that makes me notice anything around me that isn't right, that isn't what God would want. And if I can do something about it, fine, do it. Now, most of the time, there's not anything you can do about it. You don't have the time, or you don't have the talent, or whatever. But, you, but if you just notice, then when the day comes when there is something you can do, you'll do it. And that can be something as insignificant as pe picking up a piece of paper on the floor that somebody threw there, or starting a new political party. It doesn't make any difference as long as you're taking responsibility noticing and trying to do what you can. Of course, that's all based on this act of hope in the victory of Christ. And I think that, like all the other five, to have that hope that Christ is really going to triumph in spite of what you see around you, I say that's a mystical experience. What human being really could have that hope? I think if we have it human, then we call it optimism. And I read somewhere that in the Bataan Death March, which all of you are too young to and after World War, in World War II, the Japanese marched their prisoners, you know, in this terrible march from the Philippines. Um, one of the survivors of that said, the first ones to die were the optimists. The ones who said, we'll be out by Christmas. They died. Hope is not optimism. Hope is believing that God is going to achieve this in spite of all the appearances. And I say that's a mystical experience. So those are my five, five things that I think uh, sum up. Christian life, and if you want to go through the catechism of the Catholic Church, you can fit every paragraph in there under one of those five headings, but that's easy. <laughs> so give me questions. Questions, objections, arguments, uh, additions, subtractions. Floor is open. Yes? One, the Catholic bookstore that used to be on Poplar, you know, not too far from yeah. Target and stuff, yeah. it's gone, right? It's uh, moved to, I can drive there, but I can't take the street. It's, it's further north and to the right. It's, it's, um, it's, it's still called. It's moved west. On top of I think it's moved east. Oh, and it's further north. Do you know where it is? Anyway, it's still called St. Paul. St. Paul Bookstore. You can find it. You can call it. You can find it in the telephone book. Do you have books in your books or there? They have some, yes. Take a moment and tell us about your books. Oh, or at least some cheap of them. Yeah. Oh, I put over here the latest books that I've written. Um, anything you want, you can take. If you want to leave some money for it, fine. But don't pay the price on the book. Anything. I don't want to get rich. I just want to be rich. So anything you want. Take, take What's a there? couple of them and hold up for the Okay. okay. Uh, and we need to, to have a contact for you. 
people want to that view the video want to contact you, they can do so. Hisway.com. Hisway, www.hisway.com. Sister Claudia will see the info thing and she'll send you the books if you want. <clears throat> this book I wrote uh, in 1998. It, gave, it explains these five things I believe in terms of steps to grow into the fullness of life. It's a very practical, easy book to read. Those are the I'm five that you covered. Yes. yes. Those it's five whole, mysteries. Whole thing is very practical. It is, because if it's not practical, it ain't worth it. Well, Heidi and Jackson said, some people are so heavenly minded, they ain't no earth to be good. Yeah. So, <laughs> you can't get it down to earth. Um, I have the address for the books for. Oh, you do? What is it? Uh, it is uh, 5101 Sanderlin Avenue. Sanderlin Avenue. Sweet 111. See, right here in the program. I can't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, this book will say, show these five mysteries I explained as five steps to going into the fullness of life. Then I wrote these three. <clears throat> this is the same five mysteries as the five promises of baptism. That's what is most closest to what I explained today, the promise of a new identity, divine enlightenment, divine empowerment, of posterity, bearing fruit in your life, and the promise of victory in the kingdom of God. This one is not interesting to anybody but Catholics, but it shows how these five mysteries are celebrated one after another in the Mass. Catholics don't have a clue what the Mass is all about. And this book is the most practical book to show them the mystery of the Mass, but in a way they can understand. It follows these same questions. This one is really cute. This one shows those same five mysteries as the first five phrases of the R5. Oh. It's intriguing. It really is. So, oh, and this one, <clears throat> this one just came out. This is my latest book. It's called A Fresh Look at Confession. And it's, it's really good. If you're a Catholic and you don't like confession, or even if you do, it'll give you more appreciation for it. But this takes, I take these five mysteries and show in confession, how do you deal with the call to a new identity? How do you deal with the call to discipleship? <clears throat> People don't come into confession usually saying, I don't read the Bible. So said, well, you should. You know, sometimes they'll say, I don't go to Mass. I said, we got just as much obligation to read the Bible, but you don't know it. Uh, they don't come in and say, my lifestyle isn't bearing witness to Christ, or... I'm not expressing my faith and my hope and my love and my dealing with every person, or I'm not working to establish the reign of God on earth. So this book shows confession from that point of view. Ah, good for you. I'm glad you bought the commercial there. Any questions? Yeah, here we go. Amelia? Yeah, can you talk about the WIT prayer? The WIT, see, <clears throat> practical. This new identity, how in the, to be aware, the whole thing is to be aware. What I urge people to do is this. The minute you wake up in the morning, before you even open your eyes, say, Lord, I give you my body, the way I did at baptism. You get to be my age. It's 81, Jim. When you get to be my age, you say, I don't know why you want it, but it was your idea. <laughs> so you say, Lord, live this day with me, live this day in me, live this day through me. W-I-T, with me and through. But then all day long, <clears throat> before everything you do, Lord, do this with me, do this in me, do this through me, do this with me, do this in me, do this through me, if you can form the habit <clears throat> of saying that all day long, gradually your whole consciousness is elevated and you become aware that you are never alone. Christ is always with you. And he's not just by your side as a friend. <clears throat> he's in you, acting in you, and acting through you. So I call that the wit prayer. And I would push that more than anything else. Mm -hmm. Amelia, you're great. Come around every place I go. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We'll do. You're a Jesuit. Uh, you can tell by the way he speaks, he's a Jesuit. <laughs> they're the smartest. Oh, they're, I like that. They're top drawer. <laughs> <laughs> they are. They're the top. We always say, you know, the Jesuits are the top. Well, I was a Jesuit. I came here and found a religious order that didn't work, but in the process, the provincial suggested I joined the Memphis Diocese, so I was never disaffected from the Jesuits. No, of course not. <laughs> but a group of Jesuits one night who put out America magazine was sitting around. The magazine was put to bed and they were just sitting around. And right after Vatican II, all the old folks were resisting and the young folks were going crazy and they were all talking about how bad everything is in the church and in the Jesuits. <clears throat> and one of them at the end of the evening lifted up his glass and he said, Well, you're right. He said, the Jesuits are no expletive good. 
We're still the best <laughs> expletive instrument that God's got. <laughs> and I'll buy that. Yeah, it's true. And it's true. They're the best teachers. Good. They're not they fortunate enough to hurt them. You're wonderful. Yeah, well, I remember, you know, you don't forget them. <laughs> <laughs> what, uh, what was the order that you meant to found? We called it the House of the Lord, and uh, it got off to a great start, but then the, the community totally changed the direction, so we just fell apart. Here in Memphis? Mm -hmm. So they moved east, in other words. Well, <laughs> they moved out. <laughs> This is, yeah. this is such an area, uh, such a difficult area to, to introduce something like that. Yeah. As far as Catholicism in Memphis, you know, yeah. um, we're not top draw because there are not that many of us. Well, Jesus didn't have much success in Nazareth either. If you really oh, think of so it. Well, it just kind of happens. No, you, were, just, you were a prophet without honor in your own yeah. country. Right? That's right. One of my friends that works with me says, Mike, you know, your books are the best thing out there, except they're not out there. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's all right. Other questions? Well, I'm working on one. Too, right? yeah, on one. Come on, Eddie, you can get it out there. And generate I that. one. <coughs> Could you comment on, on the current state of the Catholic Church in the world and anything that this new, this, this major... Uh, in developments, or, or just the, remember your own family. Okay, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll keep it clean. Okay. <laughs> the most negative thing, and it's going to turn into a positive thing. I think the church at the present moment, uh, let's don't say church, I think the hierarchy in the church is characterized by a very strong resurgence of Phariseeism. Now, by Phariseeism, I don't mean hypocrisy, I mean a religion focused on law observance. There's all sorts of stuff you can say about mm -hmm. this. But because of this, personally, I tell people, don't ever identify the Catholic Church with the hierarchy. You can't assume that just because somebody's a bishop, he's a representative Catholic. That's, or a priest either. That's crazy. You don't assume that somebody's a real patriot just because he's a politician. So why should you presume that someone's a good Catholic because he's a priest or, or a bishop? So you have to get out of this idea that the position confers holiness. And the one who said that was Lord Acton. The same went after the Vatican, First Vatican Council, said the Pope had practically absolute power in the church. He said power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. But he said it in a letter to Bishop Mandel Creighton in which he said, I don't agree with you that people in positions should be assumed to be good people. He said, I think the opposite is true. He says, great people are almost always evil people. He said, power corrupts. So, he said, the greatest heresy is to believe that position confers holiness. So, ordination doesn't make you holy. To be ordained as a priest, that doesn't make you holy. So, that's the first thing. That sounds negative. There's a huge battle going on in the church right now between those who want to go back before Vatican II and frankly, in my opinion, which is not infallible, I think that includes the Pope and most of the bishops who are all hand-picked by the Popes to be branch managers and yes men. So they want to go back before Vatican II and turn back the clock. The, but this, here's the good news. This very effort is exciting a tremendous response. People are writing articles and books. Bishops are standing up. All sorts of bishops, all sorts of several bishops have written books one is the reform of the papacy by Archbishop John Quinn. Another one is confronting power and sex in the Catholic Church by Bishop Jeffrey Robinson. The bishops are standing up and saying, these are the abuses in our church. And they're calling for things like local election of bishops, obviously married priesthood. They're calling for the ordination of women. Um, the Pope really gets mad about that. Um, they're calling for... Uh, giving communion to Catholics who are divorced and remarried without an annulment. It's, it's widespread. And it's, I could give you all sorts of explanations behind it. But I'm talking about bishops and cardinals and great theologians, not just guys like me, but I mean the big wheels are doing this. So the very bad things in the church are exciting this tremendous wave of thought 
and expression and people are coming out of the woodwork and making themselves heard and I personally believe that we're the, the reform of the church that began with Vatican II is beginning to take more and more momentum. I'm saying that within 50 years, and I think I'm conservative there, you will see a transformed church where bishops are locally elected, we have a married priesthood. That's not going to solve any problems. Married priesthood, does. marriage doesn't solve people's problems. It gives you more. But, yeah, but there's no reason not to have a married priesthood. Um, I think you'll see all of these reforms and hopefully a breaking down of the centralization of church power in Rome. This is contrary to our tradition, contrary to our theology, that the Pope should be the CEO of the Catholic Church. That is not his job. His job is to keep the real heads of the church, which are the bishops in their diocese, united. His job is not to tell them what to do and to organize the church like a, like a boss. That's real. I've said things very quickly here, so, you know. That's pretty profound. Um, I would say that's going to be marvelous. It needs to happen. Yes. But have to leave out. John Paul is an example of something I think we really need to face. You can be good and bad at the same time. Um, the fact that you're a saint doesn't mean that you don't have deep flaws. One of my favorite saints is... But if you're a human being, you can't be without flaws. That's right. It's impossible. I think John Paul, if you read his letters, I would canonize him for his spirituality. He says things I wouldn't dare to say that are so radical, so good. If you look at his government of the church, I would put him in Dante's Inferno. Oh, of course he would. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, look who he put in charge. Who did he put in charge? Well, the folks we have now. Yeah, Ratzinger. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. He, was he was running it before yeah. John Paul died. I wonder if you would comment on, you know, we know that around the time of the Nicene Council, uh, after Nicene Council. Constantine called in Eusebius, who had been the scribe on the council, and told him to go find, verify the books that should be the Bible. So in other words, for 325 years, there was no Bible collection. Right? Well, not quite. They were, they were, there were several collections. What there wasn't was an agreement on just which books belonged in the Bible and not. And which ones? They, but most of the ones that we were using now they were using then, and they may have accepted some others, or maybe some of them they didn't really think were the Word of God, but by and large it was pretty much the same as it is now, I think. At what point did it reach that? Because some of the books were like written 50 years after Christ, and some of them 150 years, yeah. and, and all that. The only name I know, I'm not really good on history here, it was Pope Siricius who set the list that we have now, and I don't know what century he was. I'm going to say... I really don't know. I don't know. But he set the list. It seemed to come there. about during the period between the Nicene Council and the Council of Constantinople. So 500 years, it, it tended to be in place. Okay. I, I can't say because yeah. I'm not good on the dates there. And, and it was, uh, it seemed like that this was where so many things got argued out. And, and uh, just wanted, if you don't, if that's not your forte, then I won't ask you to comment on it. But I would just want to really add something. The only thing I would comment on is this, that because um, I just learned this recently. I mean, it's always been there. If you want to know what the church believes, the first place to look is to the laity. I would have said, oh, you look what the popes and councils have, have written down, you know. Uh -uh. You first look to the laity. It's the general consensus of, the, of, the, of all the faith. And then the bishops and the popes and stuff, they're expressing what the laity believe. Now, that's the real source. So the same thing with the scripture. Who says that these are the books? Well, these were the books that the people accepted as the word of God. They were written, you know, one book's written, another book they read in church. They used to read Virgil in church. They thought that he was an inspired book at one point, you know, some of the stuff he said. So um, it's the, you have to go back to the people, and then the bishops sort of affirm or confirm or formulate what the belief of the church is. Well, there were a lot of reputations written, a lot of uh, reputations of books that we don't even have, that we didn't even know existed except for the reputations. So there was a lot of argument going on during yes. that five, uh, 325 to 500. And see, that's another thing. Right now, in Rome, the Pope and the Curia want to suppress argument. 
They won't even let the bishops discuss a married priesthood. They won't let the bishops discuss the ordination of women. This is tyranny, and it is not according to Catholic tradition. Our tradition is, let the good times roll. Let's talk. Let's argue. Let's argue about everything. And the more freedom we have to discuss, the more we're going to come into the truth. So it's one of the things I don't like about the church right now. Mr. Gis, Eddie? Yeah, I want to ask you, uh, whom do you regard as perhaps the greatest Catholic philosopher of all time, uh, and whom do you regard as possibly the most important current Catholic philosopher and or theologian? And the first one I can answer real easy. I think it was Thomas Aquinas. It's hard to argue against Thomas if you really take him on. Uh, who's the best now? I'm not informed enough to say. Maybe it's Jim Townsend. I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't know. I couldn't give you a name. Okay. What do you think of Jacques Maritain? I like him. I don't... There's some things I remember. Now, this is going back in, in time here. There's some things I remember having some reserves about, but generally speaking, I think he was good. We have a bunch of guys. Jacques Maritain, Yves Congar, Carl Rahner is a guy that I really... When he starts writing philosophy, he becomes a German intellectual and becomes totally unintelligible. But when he's writing spiritual stuff, he's really good. Um, so I couldn't answer the second question. What about philosophers outside the church, like Spinoza and others that came along and that? I plead ignorance. I mean, I've studied these. I studied like in surveys. You can't know somebody's philosophy in a little survey course. You know? So I just have to plead ignorance. Uh, one last question. Yeah. Uh, I can't think. Of, I always can't think of this guy's name. Uh, he's one of the, the the most popular apologists for Catholicism. He wrote the Father Brown series. You know who I'm talking oh, about? Oh, G.K. Chesterton. Yeah. yeah. Uh, what do you think about? Uh, I, I love it. There's a current resurgence of interest in him. I think. Oh, good. Really, I read. All, all, I don't know if I've read everything he wrote, but I've written. I read a whole lot of what he wrote, and everything I've read, I've liked. Oh, that's years ago, so maybe I'm wrong on it. But well, yeah, I like Chesterton. I read his book on Thomas Aquinas. I thought it was very good. Yes. He has a sense of humor. Yeah. And one of the, he said some great things. One of the things that struck me in high school, I was reading a book that was way over my head. He called it Orthodoxy. He said, the reason that the ancients tell us the rivers ran with wine you know, in the fairy tales is to recall that first glorious moment when we discovered they, ran, they run with water. That's profound. So I, really, I like Chester. Would you like to take just a minute and 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 uh, kind of do a wind up uh, message for our viewers? I, I got one. Oh, we got one more question. Yeah, explain what you were talking about with your your uh, look at the confession and and can you discuss that in a more detail? About confession? Mm -hmm. In a nutshell. We can go on to all sorts of other things, but the real sins are never confessed in confession. <laughs> they sent me down to integrate two parishes in Louisiana, black and white. We had two churches 100 yards apart. Mm -hmm. We face the problem of integration in every move, you know, everything we're going to do, whether we're going to integrate it or not. Mm -hmm. The only place it almost never came up was in confession. Nobody had any problems about racism in confession. <laughs> they didn't think of themselves as racists, you see. And nobody ever confessed having slaves when we had slaves. Nobody ever confessed torch or burning heretics at the stake when we had the Spanish Inquisition. And we can start talking about things now. I don't think anybody's confessing the fact that we're going to war, because that's not totally agreed on yet in the church. But that I think the day will come when people will say, as they now, now if you had a, you know, one of your great, great, great grandchildren or somebody said, how could you have had slaves? Your great grandfather. He said, Well, honey, everybody did it in those days. We didn't know any better. How could you have had racial segregation? That's a sin. I know it is, honey, but nobody knew it at the time. Someday they'll say, How is it that in the 21st century you all actually accepted war? And you thought that Christians could fight in a war. And we'll say, Well, honey, everybody thought it at the time. So it's we're just we're just gonna keep evolving. And confession, if we keep looking at our conscience and keep examining our hearts, not just some kind of rule book, God will be able to enlighten us through confession to come to a higher idea.
You still want me to summarize? Well, if there's any message that you would like to give to the viewers. Uh, I would say go. this, yes. In everything that you have been taught, and of course I'm thinking primarily of Catholics, but I think this is true of everybody, not just Christians. Whatever you've been taught, look for the mystery in it. If it, if it sounds very understandable and very, very, very clear and so forth, say, well, wait a minute, this is probably true, what I understand, but it's not the truth, because the truth is going to be much deeper, and there's going to be mystery in it. So I'm, that's, that would be my thing. Look for the mystery of your identity. Don't just say I'm a Catholic, sociologically, I do these things that a sociologist cannot can identify. The mystery is that you have received the divine life of God. Deal with that. Look at the mystery of divine enlightenment. Don't just say, well, I read the Bible, that's a good thing to do, you know, and good words of God. Look for the mystery of divine enlightenment. Don't say, I like to give good example, I try to live a good lifestyle. Look for the mystery of empowerment by the Holy Spirit. Don't say, I just try to be nice to people, I'm loving to people, I hope. Look for the mystery of Christ in you expressing his truth to your expression of faith, his hopes, his love. Look for that. And finally, don't just say, we've really got to get out there and inform the world. I've got to get into social action. I've got to change things. That's good. Say, wait a minute. I'm, I'm participating with Jesus Christ in the mystery of his triumph over sin and death and everything that diminishes human life on earth. And whether I see the results or not, I'm living out this mystery as long as I try. That's the way I would sum it up. Well, thank you very much for being with us thank on the floor Very important. We have um, Reverend Robert J.B. McMillan that will be with us next week. He's an independent New Thought minister from Little Rock. And then we have uh, the retired minister, Reverend Bernard Dozier, that will be here the following week. And then the last speaker this month will be Eddie Middleton, who has been here posing questions. <laughs> and he'll be talking about uh, medieval philosophy which you can't separate from the church. We invite you to come back and, 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 and hear Eddie's uh, dissertation on the, on the church at the end of the month. Right. I could ask him questions the way he asked Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And do a little more homework, too. And we want to thank you viewers for being with us today on the Core Concepts Lecture Series show. Anybody want some books, y'all? Just take them.